This is the last chapter. So I am going over chapter summaries for this fine and excellent textbook, Madder Interaction, Shabai and Sherwood. I'll put the link to the playlist to all my other uh, reviews down below. And let's get started. So again, this is just a review. I would recommend reading the book. But let's get started, like I said. So we're in chapter 23, Electromagnetic Radiation. So far, we've done this, okay? These are the Maxwell's equations that we have it so far. We have Gauss's law. Let me write it down. E dot n hat dA equals QN over epsilon naught. So this is the magnet, the electric flux through some closed surface, and this is equal to the total charge inside divided by epsilon naught. That's what that says, Gauss's law. Then we have Gauss's law for magnetism. It looks very similar, but different. This says that the magnetic flux through some closed surface, B is a magnetic field, is equal to zero, or there's no magnetic net charge. Then we have this, E dot DL. This is the, uh, the line integral of E dot DL around some closed path. So we could call this the EMF, right? It's if around a closed path, it should be zero, but it's not because it could be caused by negative, a time derivative of the magnetic flux. It's a really big idea. This is Faraday's law. This says, so these two together say there's two ways to make electric fields. I can make an electric field with the, with the charge or with a changing magnetic flux. Got it? Okay. And then we had this one, B dot dl the path integral b dot dl is equal to mu naught times i n so this is the ampere's law this says that the magnetic field is created by an, an electric current and we used that before but we need to fix this so to fix this let's consider the following situation imagine that i have let me see if i can draw this without destroying things too much that's not bad Suppose I have an electric current coming into a, a small capacitor. And so that electric current comes out over there too. Okay. And I want to do Ampere's law right around the capacitor. It's a really tiny capacitor, very close together. And so I draw the following uh, path. That's pretty good. Look at that. And then I know the shape of the magnetic field looks like this, right? It looks like this, 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 this this that's b and i can integrate b dot dl around that loop right that's fine and it and it should have something to do with this current now let's draw this from the side i'm going to blow it up a lot from the side here's my path looking at it from the side current comes in now you'll see that i do get b coming out of the page B going into the page right there. B dot DL is going to be B times the, the length of that circle, assuming B is constant. That's such a good picture. I did a great job. But the problem here is that if this is my surface bounded by that curve and it's a circle, there's no current passing through it. Yes, there's current over here and there's current over here, but there's no current in the middle of that capacitor. There is an electric field, though. So remember that charge builds up over here, and then that pushes charge away right there, and we get the electric field inside has a magnitude of Q over A over epsilon naught, and so this has an area of A. Well, what is the electric flux over that surface? So this is the surface, that circular surface right there. So this just goes, cuts in between those two. I want to find the flux. Now, outside of there, the electric field is zero. So we're just talking about the area of that, that plate right there. So I can say the electric flux is equal to the integral of E dot n hat dA. And so I'm integrating E dot dA over this surface. N hat's in the same direction, so that's constant. So this is going to be E times A. But now E depends on that. So I can write this as Q over A epsilon naught, that's E, times A, or Q over epsilon naught. So the electric flux is Q over epsilon naught. Now, the charge on this Q charge changes, right? So remember that I equals dQ dt. 
So if I take the derivative of, of the flux, d flux dt, it's going to be equal to 1 over epsilon naught dq dt, kind of slanted there, or 1 over epsilon naught i. So I can get something that looks like the current if I have this 1 over epsilon naught in term in there. Right? Epsilon naught times the rate of change of the flux is equivalent to I. I know the magnetic field up here, from, it has to be the same as due to this current because it should look the same. And the current is changing, it's changing the electric field, it all works. So this gives us now our new Faraday's law. I should say also, if this is my wire, I could pick a surface bounded by it that looks like that and so that I does pass through it. So both of those have to agree. And the way to do that is to modify our equation like this, B dot DL equals mu naught I N plus mu naught epsilon naught, the derivative of respect to time, the integral of E dot N hat DA. So there's two ways to make an elect a magnetic field. I can have an electric current or a changing electric flux. There's two ways to make an electric field. Charge, changing magnetic flux. It's kind of a symmetry situation. It's kind of nice. Okay, so that's our correct, our corrected Maxwell's equation. Now let's look at the situation because we want to talk about light. I'm going to start a new sheet of paper right here. Let's imagine that I have a region of space. And it's a, it's a block like this. Let's see. There, I did it. And in this region, we have a constant electric field going up. I'll just draw a few ve vectors. There's, there's E. And then I have a constant magnetic field going this way. That's B. And this whole region of space moves with some velocity V that way. Let's see if we, and so there's, this is what we call free space. And so in free space, Q equals zero, I equals zero. So there's no currents and there's no charges. Let's use this and see how we can get Faraday's law and the Maxwell Ampere law to work. Now, I should point out that if it's free space, and we go back to these other two laws. This one, Gauss's law, says the flux is zero. No use there, that one's already zero. So these don't really tell us anything, but these two, or this one and our new one can. So let me just redraw this from a side perspective to make it a little bit easier. So here's my space. Here's E, and then B, coming out of the paper. And now I'm going to pick uh, a, a little square, a rectangular square right here. So this is moving that way. This has a height h, a width w. And as this moves into that region, then I'm going to get a changing magnetic flux right there. The changing magnetic flux, uh, flux magnetic b, I'm sorry, would be at that point, it'd be b times that area. So it's b times the area, which is going to be h, let's call this x h times x, but the derivative of that flux, d phi b dt, is going to be b h dx dt, or b h v. So that's the change in flux. We did stuff like that before. Now, we can also relate that to the path integral of e dot dl around here. So e dot dl is some value right there. It's going to be e times h, but then it's 0 because e and h are E and DL are perpendicular, zero, 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 zero everywhere else. So I get this. Or E equals V B. Now let's do it again using the Ampere Maxwell law. So I'm gonna look at this from the top. It's still the same cube. But now looking at it from the top, I have the magnetic field. Let's see, I'm looking at it from the top. The magnetic field is that way, and uh, E is coming out, right? Because if you look at it from the top. And now I'm going to draw another rectangle this way. Again, a height h, 
and the thing's moving that way. Now the electric flux, the changing electric flux looks like the magnetic flux. So I'm gonna get, uh, let's just write it out all in one step. D electric flux DT is gonna be equal to uh, E H V. But according to the Ampere Maxwell law, B dot DL, which is B H, is mu naught epsilon naught times that. So I get B H is mu naught epsilon naught E H V, or B equals mu naught epsilon naught E V. So I have two equations that have E V in there and B. Let's solve this one for E, because I already did that, and plug it in down there. I get B equals mu naught epsilon naught E, which is VB, times V, or mu naught epsilon naught B, V squared. The B's cancel, and I get V squared is one over mu naught epsilon naught. So this says that in order for these two fields to exist in space, this region has to move at that speed. So let's say V is the square root of one over mu naught epsilon naught. Remember, one over four pi epsilon naught is nine times 10 to the ninth. Mu naught over four pi is equal to 10 to the negative seventh. So I can use these two and write V is the square root of one over mu naught is gonna be four pi over mu naught. I'm gonna write it like that since I have that number. And this is uh, one over four pi epsilon naught and the pi, four pi is cancel. So now I can write this as the square root of 10 to the negative seventh times I'm sorry, it's 10 to the seventh, right? I just had a brain melt right there. Where'd it go? Do you ever do that? Just like, whoop, freak out. It's 10 to the, it's 10 to the seventh, right? Yeah, it's gotta be. No, it's 10 to the negative seventh. That's 10 to the negative seventh. Yeah, because it's one, oh, one over that. It's one over, why am I having so much trouble? I was gonna do this like cool thing, like, hey, look at, look at me with my numbers and all. 10 to the negative seventh. So this is 10 to the, 10 to the seventh. And this is, right, 10 to the ninth. Nine times 10 to the ninth. Ugh. <laughs> so I get nine times 10 to the ninth. So I get the square root of nine times 10 to the 16th. Okay, it works. And I can take the square root of nine is three. The square root of 10 to the 16th is 10 to the eighth. And if you do the units, you get meters per second. I did it, okay. And that's C, the speed of light. So that field, region of space, will only work if it's moving at the speed of light. And in fact, it is light. Okay. We've got a couple other things to look at. How do you make uh, an electromagnetic wave? Let me show you a simulator really quick um, because I think this will help. So switching over to the computer, uh, we can make an electromagnetic wave with an accelerated charge. So there's a great uh, Python demo in here on WebVPython made for the book, made for the book. Uh, so number 23, 2D, this one right here, I think it is. It's not loading. Look at that blank. Why did it not load? If I refresh this, maybe click it again. 23. Hmm. Okay, the units didn't work. And now this. Okay, that's fine. 
So basically, if you take an electric charge and you shake it, you'll make an, a, an electromagnetic field, a, a radiating electromagnetic wave. So we don't need to see that, I guess. There's a lot of things in this chapter. It's really too much, to tell you the truth. Um, I want students to know Ampere Maxwell. I want them to know uh, speed of light. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of other really important things. Let's look at energy density. Oh, I don't even want to derive this because I think it's, I feel like I'm off. And it's not that big of a deal. Let me just write it down. I'm not going to derive it. Uh, remember that the energy density uh, for electric and magnetic fields, we did this before, is one half epsilon naught E squared. We can find this by looking at a capacitor and moving the plates apart. And then plus one half one over mu naught B squared, that's the magnitude of the magnetic field. We do this by changing the current in an inductor in a solenoid, and you can find this. And so this is the energy per unit volume. Uh, you can actually find the energy flux in uh, energy flux, I'll call it E flux, it's energy. Energy flux, which is the rate of change of energy on a surface, uh, and it's going to be equal to um, one over mu naught E times B in watts per meter squared. So remember watt is a unit of power. This leads us to the pointing vector. S is one over mu naught E cross B. So the pointing vector tells you something about the power direction for electromagnetic waves. If you take the electric and the magnetic field and the cross their directions, you get the direction of the wave travel. And this is the power per unit uh, area. That's what this gives us, the pointing vector. And on the surface of the Earth, S, due to the sun, the magnitude is 1,400 watts per square meter, just so you can get an idea of that. Um, okay, I think I'm going to stop there. There's some stuff in there about how light pushes on matter. It's pretty cool, but it's kind of hard to show on paper. Uh, I don't really have any calculations to do with that. Then it goes into refraction, uh, lenses, uh, interference, a whole bunch of cool stuff with light polarization, but I, I just think it's too much uh, at this point. And I'm just trying to give you this summary just to wrap up the whole semester, uh, and then I can put it all together. But that is the end of Chapter 23 for Matter and Interactions. Like I said, if you want to see all the whole playlist, I'm going to try to make uh, a website with all my links together so you can kind of look at them. Uh, but hopefully you find that useful. Still, it's the great, greatest book I've had. And that's that. I'll talk to you later.